Hello, hello. This is Johannes Watri from Holtron. Today, I want to talk about two types of databases that I use in my daily development. So in here, you can see SQLite, which I have utilized for my Android applications. It, it can run as a standalone SQL database within the device. And in here, in the back end, the server side, I'm running MongoDB, which is no SQL database. It's astounding how little code you actually need to uh, store and get information objects from the database. As you can in see in here, these are stored and collected at, as collections in here. So, quite a difference. But uh, I believe I cannot utilize MongoDB as a standalone within the Android, at least not yet, without some type of a cloud integration through the Cloud Atlas or something. Please tell me if you know better than me, but uh, I hope in the future it could but till then, I have to uh, stick with the uh, SQLite and we're going to compare a little bit about what it means to save something into SQL database versus into MongoDB no SQL database. Okay, before we start, let's take a look quickly, take a look what I do. I develop under the name Hold to Run. You can go directly into my home base, home page. In here, you can see the playlist of code walkthroughs. Go into YouTube, see more if you like to. And in the apps, you can check out the application that I'm uh, currently developing. Or go directly into Google Play and try them out yourself. Good. Let's start. Okay, now let's start from the mobile and with the SQLite database. So I'm gonna go through what I use in my daily as a daily driver and I always create so-called database handler which extends the uh, SQLite open helper. That way I can in my custom class I can access all the SQL functions to uh, create tables, database, and read and write my data objects from that database. So in here, you have to have a database name, as I have for my application server doc. Then how many tables do you need to create? I have two, so we'll be focusing on a server doc, which is table name, server doc variable. And each table will, in minimum, require the ID, which is going to store the object value, so-called entry in my database. And of course, database version. So while you're extending the SQLite open helper, you have to pass in the context, database, and DB version and now you're good to go. So if you need to do additional functions while the uh, database object is being initialized, you can do through on create and on upgrade. So I'm just logging these. I haven't found any use cases in my simple applications yet. So first, we have to now create the table for the name server doc. Okay, so I call this while the app starts. So when the user opens the app for the first time, that's a good place to uh, initialize your table, ensure it exists. And just to be sure, each time I write something into the database, I go through this function. Okay, so using the SQL script create table if it not exists, it's gonna know if it does 
or does not need to create the table. So in here you're gonna need to pass in the table name that was our variable server doc. I'm just passing it through my function. And then we have to tell the table that, hey, you're gonna have a parameters of column ID and the entry, column entry, which holds the actual value. So those I had hard coded in here, pretty much the table name and column ID and column entry. Good. Then we have the query for the SQL function. Now we have to uh, open this database as a writable database. And with this database, we can then run the uh, SQL, exec SQL for our database table query, which is the create table query. Good. When everything is success and it didn't yet exist, it's going to create us new table. Okay. Then we want to uh, save data into the database. So this is my daily driver function insert and format entry. So why format? Because when I deal with the runtime code, I always handle everything, every user parameters within an object. So these are just my parameters. But this is something you always need with the databases, which is an ID to identify this, this object into that column ID. Okay, so I just have a random uh, ID created for each object. So like I told you, I check if the table doesn't yet exist, then we if it's not table, then we go through the create table if not yet exists. So this always ensures we have a table to save into. So into the SQL database, we cannot just pass in a code object. So we have to first ourselves serialize that. So that's why we're using JSON. As you can see in here, I have a JSON and JSON object. So with JSON, we're passing in our code object, which holds the parameters that the user has requested. And we go to JSON and we can now return a string value if everything is success. It's been serialized. So if that was success, we can continue and we don't have to return false and stop the code in here. And instead, while it was success, we again open this database as a writable database. And we have to initialize content values because the content values gonna, we're gonna now tell that, hey, into the column, column ID, which was part a parameter within the table, we pass in that object's ID and then into the column entry we can pass in that actual serialized data into. So these you have to come up by yourself as you can see up here. I just hard coded column ID is ID and column entry is entry. So I know how to use that table now. So there can be two use cases. You have to replace that object within the database or you are passing in a new object which doesn't yet exist. I pretty much always use the request to replace that object because it's very rare that in the database we just always create new objects. Of course we're user might update the values as he sees fit. So normally I just go through replace request. So you can go through that with database insert with on conflict and we assign the table name. So the table name for my table name was server doc and we pass in the co content values and SQ we request to conflict and in, res in replace in conflict pretty much. So 
it's gonna do that if it exists it's replacing it okay if you would know and you're sure that you're creating new object which doesn't yet exist then you can go through database insert table name and just pass in the content values but it if for any reason it exists it's gonna give you an error and it's not gonna save that object into the database good then the sql database gives us the result and through this you can just check was it a success or did it fail so now we know if it failed or if it was success so that's pretty much about how you write your function into the uh, database within SQL. So how do we read from the SQL? It's pretty much almost the same, just a reverse. So now we don't have to pass in any data. We're just going to request a data with the uh, ID of that item object so that's why we have to give them IDs unique IDs so we're gonna call read and format entry again because it was in serialized format we have to deserialize it back into a coding object with the ID we can now start making a query first we have to create again this database as a readable database this time we don't write now we write sql query select from our table name and from that id of that entry id now it knows that hey i from that id from that table i can fetch that data for this guy so then we get that with the database raw query and we pass in this query uh, uh, request and we get the result and then we can start iterating through this result and we get string with that column entry that was the name of that data value and then we need to start deserializing it back into an actual object if this query was success pretty much if it's not null we can start deserializing and in our deserializing we're using json and we just say read value from this uh, json string and we give it a data model class of our object and it can then return if, if everything goes well it's going to return an actual coding object nice and now while we have our entry object we can just return it back into our code and start using it so that's how you create table database table and uh, a simple uh, use case for reading and writing data with SQL. Okay, now let's take a look of how we do the same with MongoDB. So now in the server side, I really enjoy using MongoDB for the simplicity and for the fact that uh, we can pass in data objects directly without the need to manually serialize them and they're handled as collections but first let's take a look at how do we get the uh, mongodb started so this app module as you can see in here i ha i initialize my main classes through coin which is a dependency injection framework or at least dependency injection uh, application so i create my database with as a singleton with kmonko create client and it's already coroutine thread system integrated that's really nice and uh, we'll tell it to get database of a name report 
counts DP. So this is from another application. This is not ServerDoc. So this is totally different database now. And then as a factory, this is not a singleton anymore. I'm just going to tell the coin that, hey, this is going to be my custom class, which I use to write and get data from this database here, MongoDB database. And the beauty of coin as a dependency injection framework, I'm just going to tell git and it knows that this must be used with my custom class because it lacks the uh, coding database like in here you can see the uh, dependencies up there so now with this database while i initialize this within my roots in here then let's see in here I can now get my custom class database controller with coin by inject and start using this within the application. But before we go and see how we can get and insert data, let's take a look at my custom class, which actually does those read and write functions. So when this is created within my roots, we're just gonna get the collection. So database, which was already created, get collection, and we tell the object type of that collection. So now it knows what to get. So then we can start querying single objects from this collection by ID. It's pretty similar, actually really similar, similar base to use the database with an ID for the objects. But as you can see in here, like one line, one line of code, no serialize, no deserializing or anything. This is just gonna handle me back to me that native data object as is. So from this collection, we just call find, find one by ID and we pass in the ID that we want to fetch. And uh, let's take a look at th this data object that I'm saving and reading. It holds my custom parameters, which I use to uh, uh, log some object. And uh, I handle this ID as a BSON ID. So the beauty again, using this annotation is that the MongoDB actually knows that, hey, I'm not gonna use this now as an object ID when I just pass these as a collection, as a single or a bundled patch of objects. So in here, annotation of piece on ID and MongoDB knows what to do. Okay, pretty simple. So let's go and see why I'm fetching something. So get an object. So when a client needs data from the back end, it comes to this root point with an ID and uh, then we get the actual object ID from parameters. Okay. And we can now directly get a native coding object of report count and respond that back to the client. Beautiful. Very simple, no serialize, serialization, no deserialization, just handling with native coding objects. Couldn't be more simple. No, now how do we save something into the MongoDB? So I use insert report counts and I just pass in an item and tell the collection save this item. Wow, really simple. And then we can just return through if it didn't fail. So I know it was a success. So again, in this item that I'm passing, we have to have an ID annotated as an BSON at BSON ID. So the MongoDB knows that that's, it's going to use that automatically as an ID. So and how do we use this? In what situation? 
So a client connects into my endpoint in here and uh, we get this data object from that from that connection and uh, we're just gonna if everything is success we authenticate that we're just gonna say in to our DB controller to insert this as is so let's go a bit more reversed and the database controller that I had in at the beginning this here I'm just fetching it from my coin with injection for my endpoint roots. So there's not, nothing else to tell anymore about the MongoDB. It is just so beautiful and simple compared to SQLite. So that's all guys and um, please let me know actually if you know how to use MongoDB as a standalone database as it can be used also as a standalone database with with server side but can it be used as a standalone database within mobile clients within android application because this actually needs to run as a service in the background it, that's that's a bigger task to set up the mongodb as a service into your back end that's another story but Wow, I'll, I would really like to use this in the future as a standalone service, backend service for my for my mobile applications also. So before we stop, you can go into my homepage holtrun.com, holtrun.com, and then check my applications in here that I'm actively developing or go and check out more videos from my YouTube page. You can see the playlist also in my homepage or go directly into Google Play and test the applications yourself. We'll be back.